European Christianity during the High Middle Ages? Well, for starters, uh, we're going to look at education. So medieval education. And medieval education was mostly for the rich. And the biggest reason for this was that education had to be paid for. Medieval peasants on the social scale could not pay the fees that it would cost for education. Education was private. There was no public education. Most educated people worked in the church. Um, you had, besides the nobles and the other people who were rich, you would have to work in the church to get education. Many worked in the monasteries, but they had taken a vow of isolation, and their work, for the most part, remained isolated with them. If you, went, if you were a nun, if you were a brother, if you were a monk, you pretty much lived outside of society. Maybe if you were a poor peasant, it would be an honor for your family if one person in your family would become a monk or a, a nun. And even if you're nobles, noble families would have often have like a nun or a monk in the family. And you would live off in your own monastery, totally separate from society, and you would be spend a lot of time in prayer. In fact, in a lot of the monasteries, there were vows of silence where you could not talk for long periods of times, weeks, months, where you were not supposed to speak. So the number one job was to be praying for the other people in the society. Now, along with that, there also develops in the society a common language. Um, <clears throat> as education increases, education needs to increase, and Latin becomes the common language throughout Europe, especially for business. Um, let's take a look at, um, uh, we'll focus in on England a little bit. As medieval England developed, so did the need for a more educated population, especially in the developing world of merchant trade, people trading back and forth. If you want to trade with people from France, if you want to trade from people from the Holy Roman Empire and beyond, you're going to have to be able to communicate with them. So, important trading towns set up what become known as grammar schools. And uh, these grammar schools, um, they are pretty much formed, most of them are formed by the church. And Latin grammar formed a major part of the daily curriculum. So you would learn Latin. Latin was also the language used by merchants as they traded in Europe. So when you're going back and forth, you know, you teach your kids how to, do Latin, to read and speak Latin, and they could trade with other people. Um, so the merchants needed Latin to trade, so they would send their sons to grammar schools. All the lessons taught in the grammar schools were in Latin, and the lessons were taught in a way where the boys, because the sons were sent to grammar schools, had to learn the information by heart. Books at this time were too expensive in Europe, so um, a lot of it was done by memorization, learning by heart, because people did not have books. By 1500, many large towns had a grammar school. The schools were very small. Many just had one room for all the boys and one teacher who basically who had a religious background. Um, uh, oftentimes it would be um, uh, like a, a monk or a brother would be the teacher. The teacher would teach the older boys who were then responsible for teaching the younger boys. The lessons frequently started at sunrise and finished at, sun, finished at sunset. Now, this is Europe, so sunrise and sunset is different on different times of the year. This meant in the spring-summer months, school could last for a very long time. But the opposite was true in winter. In winter, the days wouldn't be so long because the, because the sun coming up and the sun coming down. The discipline was very strict, and there could also be a lot of physical punishment. So if you weren't answer, physical or corporal punishment was definitely if you were not listening or if you were misbehaving. And again, think about these days. Like, you know, during the winter time, the day is shorter. And during the summertime, the days are really long. And again, that just has to do with the sun coming up and down. All right, so let's take a look at um, uh, some of the universities. Now, the universities existed for the rich who excelled at grammar school. In England, again, for example, some of the founding of Oxford and Cambridge universities. Both were renowned seats of learning. The sons of peasants, now, they could only be educated if the lord of the manor had given their permission. So if the noble or the lord gave permission, a peasant could be educated. Any family caught having a son educated without permission was heavily fined. And the authorities often tried to keep peasants in their place because an educated peasant might prove a threat to his master as they could you know, start questioning the way that things were done. By the 12th century, the cathedral schools had been established and formed a curriculum based on Latin, the language of the Catholic Church. Let's start looking at the um, uh, universities. 
The students and um, uh, universities organized academic guilds again. So you would often have many of these people who were becoming more professionals as they were moving up in society. They wanted to see their kids educated. So sometimes with the revival of towns and everything, you saw people who used to be poor, now they were getting money and they wanted to see their kids educated. And guild, people, if you're working for a guild, you'd want to see your son educated or daughter, your, your son educated. So um, uh, the universities first started in Europe in towns like Bologna in Italy. Paris, and Salerno. There was instruction in law, theology, and medicine. And there was a big fluence of Aristotle. So going back to the Greek learnings. Now, we had talked before the Muslims had been reading the Greek works and translated them into Arabic. Well, now in the high Middle Ages, the Greek works come back into Europe. And the, uh, Aristotle's teachings are translated from Greek into Latin. Scholasticism. Uh, we'll talk about St. Thomas Aquinas a bit and scholastic theology. This, thought, this sought to synthesize or combine the beliefs of Christianity with the logical rigor of Greek philosophy. So trying to take like kind of like the best of Greek philosophy and combine it with Christianity. The most famous theologian was St. Thomas Aquinas, who we see right here, and he taught at the University of Paris. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas took a different view than we saw during the early Middle Ages. He viewed um, uh, Aristotle's teachings as complementary, or they could be taught with Christian ideals. And he believed it was possibly rationally to prove that God exists, that you could prove it rationally using many of the Greek logical theories. At this time, also during Europe, uh, there was the rise of the, the, the establishment of the sacraments, the holy rituals that brought spiritual blessings. And the church recognized seven sacraments, and these are still commonly recognized today, like baptism, marriage, penance, communion, would be some of the sacraments that we see even still in our church today. Also at this time, we see a devotion to the saints. Saints um, uh, are people who lead exemplary lives, and God holds them in high esteem. And in the church, we believe, we know many of who these saints are. We believe that you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, he was a saint. But we also believe that there's lots of people who are saints that we don't even know about. That, you know, there are saints in heaven, and we don't know about them. But there are people for, they're kind of like a model. Like, you, this is the person you should follow. Uh, they enjoy special influence with heavenly authorities. And they're able to intervene on behalf of living individuals. They have special influence, heavenly authorities, basically, that we that we ask that they'll pray for us, you know, as they go on. So I would actually kind of tie this with other religions. I mean, I think we see this in um, Africa with a little, you know, with a bit of ancestor worship. I think you see it in the same in China, too, you know, saying that the people who are beyond, that they can, they can still pray for us, they can still be a part of our lives. The Europeans prayed for saints to look after special interests and ensure them admission to heaven. Different saints had reputations for curing disease, guiding sailors, and helping the living the dead. The Virgin Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, um, <clears throat> she personified Christian idea of womanhood, love, and sympathy. And we see um, uh, a lot of places and a lot of uh, honor for the Virgin Mary during this time period. Also, we see the saints' relics, like the bones of the saints, um, different things that the, the saints had. You know, we, um, <clears throat> we see as the church assemble vast collections of relics from famous saints. The hair, the teeth, the clothes, the bones. And many people go on pilgrimage to go to these different sites, different places of saints, and pray for them. So you would pray, you know, you'd pray to a saint, and you'd have the relics or the bones there with. And we're going to see when we get to the Crusades here in a few minutes how these, how important these are seen in the society. Okay, let's move on to the medieval expansion of Europe, the Reconquista of Spain. So Spain, as we had talked about, Spain was in the Muslim kingdoms, uh, the city of uh, Cordoba we talked about, had the very large mosque and was for a long time, especially in the early Middle Ages after the fall of the Roman Empire, it was the most advanced part of Europe. But the Christians do retake over a reconquest, a reconquest of Spain. And we can see here the years, if we look on this, that goes from 1914 all the way up to 1481, before we see all of Spain being, you know, the Christians taking Spain. <clears throat> so, the kingdom of Granada falls to the Christian forces of King Ferdinand V and Queen Isabella, and the Moors lose their last foothold of Spain in this time. Uh, 
Now, the kingdom of Granada, uh, what happened was in the year 1238, the Christian reconquest forced Spanish Muslims south. And they had in the south the kingdom of Granada, which was established there for a couple hundred years. Now, it was established there was the last Moorish foot, foothold in Europe. Granada flourished culturally and economically for 200 years, but by the late 15th century, the late 1400s, internal fighting and Spain becoming stronger under King Ferdinand signaled the end of Spain. On January 2nd, 1492, the same year Columbus, who we'll bring up in a bit, King uh, Bobildi surrendered to Granada to the Spanish forces. And in 1502, the Spanish crown ordered all Muslims forcibly to convert to Christianity. The next century sees a huge number of persecutions. And in 1609, the last Moors still hurting to, to still believe in Islam were expelled from Spain. So during after this reconquest, we'll talk about the Inquisition, what happens as Spain tries to reestablish Christianity, and the Muslims are, who are living there are forced to convert or are forced to leave at this time. Next, we're going to talk about the Crusades, and we're going to watch a couple of videos on it and have a discussion upon this.